Somali forces sent to free the hijacked ship. Gun battle reported between the Somali pirates and security forces. A letter bomb explodes at the International Monetary Fund office in Paris, injuring one. The joint opposition levels allegations against the corrupt coal deal. The Supreme Court decides to consider the petition with regard to parliamentarians selling their tax-free vehicle permits. If international judges are to be brought into the country, the constitution needs to be amended. A statement from the foreign minister. Good evening and welcome. This is Prime Time News. I am Sonali Vanika Babade. And I'm Ramesh Rizal Bandar. News First has been following the developments of the hijacking of the Aris 13 with eight Sri Lankans on board throughout the day today. We have the latest updates for you right now. In your developing story tonight, Puntland forces have launched an operation to rescue the Iris 13 oil tanker and the crew of eight Sri Lankans being held by Somali pirates. Maritime forces have exchanged fire with Somali pirates who hijacked an oil tanker in the semi-autonomous region. The rescue attempt took place in the harbour region of Somalia. The Voice of America reported that the Puntland forces exchanged gunfire with a small boat carrying supplies for the pirates on board the hijacked oil tanker. Voice of America also reports that pirates have mounted heavy machine guns on the deck of the hijacked tanker. Two civilians have been injured in the gun battle. The sailors on board the Ares 13 vessel are believed to be safe, according to officials. Now, News First was able to speak with the Reuters correspondent based out of Puntland, Somalia, and he said that the situation is now calm and the sailors are safe. The head of Maritime, Abdurrahman Mahmoud Hassan, the director of General Maritime Force in semi autonomous northern region in Puntland, he said to me they tried to intercept a boat that was carrying supply to the piratists, but the piratists on the ship fired on us and so the piratist boat escaped and went into the ship. Also, I asked one of the piratists how the situation of the crew and he told me the eight crew from Sri Lanka, they are fine and they are in a peace and there is no anything happened with the crew, but only he threatened if the Puntland forces not to stop the fighting, they will kill the crew and even they pan the ship if Puntulang not stops the fire. Now the situation in harbor is calm and there is no fire exchange now. Reports surface that the Ares 13 oil tanker with a crew of eight Sri Lankans was hijacked by pirates off the coast of Somalia. Later the Somali pirates demanded a ransom for the release of the vessel and the crew. Monday's hijacking was the first such seizure of a large commercial vessel on the crucial global trade route since 2012. Aries 13 had left the Colombo port at 5.30 p.m. on the 28th of January in order to reach Mogadishu. Late on Tuesday, Oceans Beyond Piracy said in a statement that the ship was carrying gas and fuel. It is not registered with the Maritime Security Center for the Horn of Africa, which registers and tracks vessels in the region. The families of the crew members on board the Aries 13 were present at a media briefing held in Colombo this afternoon. The Sri Lankan agents that supplied the sailors for the vessel claims that the hijackers are not Somali pirates. The relatives of the ill fate sailors spoke to news first today. Mama Rajeng Ilani, then other Kiwani make a Pagoda, Karunaga Kiwan, a Karunika, Ustakara than Nakila Mang Ilana, Mangisa Karno at Termi Havana Hill. Eva Gama beat it at Balapurtino, Ekman in Yavashakati to Kerala, May Rajesa Hamima Aitana, a pay seal mummies, a pay Yati, Natadina, a mayor at a treatment, a magina dinner, Kati to Karai Hill. But for the call for the moment, all I can say is we are very, very alert. Uh, we have alerted all the necessary uh, centers and we are keeping a close watch and these hostages are safe and in, and in good health. Yes, uh, uh, my ambassador in uh, Ethiopia has been uh, working very closely with the Somali club. No, of course, as far as we have been informed, it is a, uh, it is a, it is a piracy situation. 
Okay. Well, let's say that uh, we, I'm sure they will make all possible attempts to free them unharmed. Civil society groups are saying that they have no confidence in some of the projects conducted in Sri Lanka through the Information Communication Technology Agency, or ICTA. The situation that has arisen surrounding the Google Loon project and details emerging of attempts by a private company to obtain the spectrum has given rise to doubts over projects that are being carried out by ICTA under its CEO, Mohundan Kanage. According to the website of the Information Communication Technology Agency or ICTA, several projects have been initiated covering different sectors to promote information communication technology in the island. These projects include the Government Data Center Initiative, the Consolidated Centralized ICT Solution for the EPF and the ETF, the ESAMURDI Integrated Welfare Management Program and the National Security Operations Center, which is a forensic and cyber security infrastructure development project to be implemented across borders. This is not just a matter of national security, but turns out that this program also contains a plan to swindle away the country's employee provident fund. This company has also signed an agreement to merge the EPF and ETF and develop an IT system to create access to find information. So it's not just a matter of the EPF, it is also a matter concerning national security. They have signed a number of projects. The balloon which went up crashed, so if that is the case, they must tell us what the next step is. Where is the free Wi-Fi? The Google loan project that was carried out in the country under the CEO of ICTA, Mohundan Kanage, was also unsuccessful. With the involvement of the Rama Corporation being revealed, civil society organizations allege that the project was an attempt to obtain the spectrum of the country. We saw the balloon going up and it coming down. Whose money was spent for these projects? How were the finances spent? Who is empowering these? Who is responsible? Is it ICTA? Who wasted the power with that agency? Where is the transparency? If you think you can do projects for the sake of your happiness at the expense of public funds, then that is a serious issue. Carry out an audit on the expenses that were incurred. We are requesting this under the right to information. In February 2015, an overall reshuffle of staff and responsibilities had taken place at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Now, this was revealed before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry to investigate and inquire into the issuance of Treasury bonds today. Assistant Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and Secretary of the Monetary Board, H. Karunaratna, appeared before the Commission today to provide evidence. Karunaratna revealed that following the appointment of Arjuna Mahendran to the position of Governor of the Central Bank, the heads of 14 departments were transferred during the month of February alone. Highlighting that this was an unusual practice, Karunaratna also revealed that during the year 2015, more than 30 heads of departments were given transfers, adding that the usual average was around 5 to 6 transfers. He also revealed that then Governor of the Central Bank Arjuna Mahendran made around 500 staff transfers that year, adding that the usual number is only 200 to 300 staff transfers per annum. H. A. Kahunaratna opined that the transfers were not necessary and stated that the staff as well as senior officials were not pleased with the transfers. The Secretary of the Monetary Board added that he expressed his concerns regarding the transfers to Governor Mahindran on several occasions. The composition of the Monetary Board was also raised at the Commission today. It was revealed that the Monetary Board comprises of five members who are the Governor, the Secretary to the Minister of Finance and three other quote-unquote appointed members. After the new government was elected, then Governor of the Central Bank Ajit Nivad Kabwal and two other quote-unquote appointed members, namely Neil Umagilya and Nimal Valgama, had resigned from the Monetary Board. For a decision to be made at the Monetary Board, a quorum of three is required. H. A. Karunaratna stated that after Arjuna Mahendran was appointed as the Governor, the members of the Monetary Board were the Governor himself, Secretary to the Minister of Finance Dr. S. H. Samaratunga and Mrs. Mano Ramanathan. He added that Mahendran was appointed to the Monetary Board for the remainder of former Governor Kabwal's tenure. Several months later, two others were appointed. Rajapaksa Arachilage Jatissa was appointed on the 10th of April 2015 in place of Umagilia and Prisanta Pereira was appointed on the 24th of June 2015 for the period of Valgama. It was revealed before the Commission that until the appointments of Jatissa and Pereira were made, the Monetary Board only comprised of then-Governor Arjuna Mahendran, Dr. S. H. Samaratunga and Mano Ramanathan. The Anti-Corruption Front renewed calls to expedite action against the controversial Treasury bond auction. 
A group including Venerable Ulapane Sumangalathero arrived at the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption in order to provide evidence in relation to a complaint made by the Anti-Corruption Front with the commission or the impugned treasury bond auction. Sadly, even as of yesterday, Perpetual Treasuries Private Limited is listed as a primary dealer. With the COPE report, three reports have been made public and yet the government had failed to distance Perpetual Treasuries Private Limited from this process. They have failed to suspend the power of this primary dealer. We feel that the government is purposely avoiding this matter and that is why there is a delay in the investigations. The massive amount of wealth amassed by them through this scam have been invested all across the country and they are multiplying their ill-gotten gains. They continue new to function in the bond markets. The anti-corruption front strongly urges the government to ensure that their functions are suspended. The opposition has cast its suspicion on the government's move to sign a statement of corporate intent with several state-owned business enterprises. A decision has been taken by the cabinet in secrecy to transform public service institutions such as the Ceylon Electricity Board, Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, National Water Supply and Drainage Board and the Ports Authority into enterprises. Parliament has not been informed of such a decision. This statement of corporate intent will be just the first step. Eventually, these institutions will be given to private companies. For example, talks are being held to remove most of the activities of employees at the National Water Supply and Drainage Board and hand them over to companies. There will be institutions called the National Water Supply and Drainage Board and the Ceylon Electricity Board to be seen, but services like installing meter readers and disrupting the supply of power and many more will be removed from their grasp and be handed over to private companies. Then they will begin to charge a fee for this. This is the first step. Talks are ongoing to convert these institutions into companies and bring them under the Companies Act. So who are they trying to teach? To the very director boards which they themselves appointed. Such is the joke. The finance minister is a joke and even the prime minister is talking nonsense. Meanwhile, activities taking place at certain ministries were discussed during the half an hour Satana political program last night. You might remember that the government of Mahindra Rajapaksa also toppled because of a super minister, so to speak. There is something that we understand. There was a situation where Minister Basil Rajapaksa had all the powers. I know that even you were personally frustrated. That government was toppled. But now again, they are trying to design another super minister through various agreements, aren't they? Our country and all of its politicians have had the unpleasant experience of a super minister. So it is with responsibility that I say that we will not leave any room for the creation of a super minister. You might have various opinions bottled up inside and various interests. But I say with responsibility that we will defeat all of these plans. The joint opposition today lodged several complaints against irregular coal transactions that had taken place during procurement. A group including MP Vidro Vikramanayaka arrived at the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption and the criminal investigations department to lodge a complaint against the coal deal. The joint opposition convened a media briefing before lodging the 10th complaint on the top 10 list which they claim consists of the current government's most corrupt ministers. Lanka coal, coal Samagama Yatate. Coal was purchased under the Lanka Coal Company. The country incurred a loss of 5 billion rupees due to this deal. Maitri Gunaratna, who was a former chairman of Lanka Coal Company and who was also a former UNP councillor of the southern province, made this revelation. But who confirmed this deal and who approved to proceed with the deal? It is none other than the head of the Cabinet Committee on Economic Management and the Prime Minister of this country, Ranal Vikramasinghe. Another group joins him, Paskar Lingam, Malik Samara Vikrama and Soren Bhattagoda from the Procurement Committee of the Ceylon Electricity Board. They have all come together to extend the tenure of the Swift Singapore Company. Out of the 10 revelations, the government has only dealt with the Treasury bond scam. So we thank the President for appointing a presidential commission. The government has made these ministers rogues with licenses. Why? Because no one questions them if a complaint is lodged. So we are planning to officially lodge a complaint to the Speaker. Ranil, Malik and Ravi are the top three in the top ten list. The President says that he is aware of this, but he has not done anything about it. So the public mandate is to stop these things. <laughs> Here's a look at several key judicial proceedings from the day. 
The commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption informed the Supreme Court that it would commence an investigation in relation to the complaint received that 27 parliamentarians have engaged in misappropriation by selling off their duty-free vehicle permits. This is announced when the petition filed by attorney at law Naga Ananda Kodituaku seeking that an order be made to the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption to investigate the complaint was taken up today. The petition was taken up before the bench comprising of Chief Justice Priyasat Depp and Justices Sisera Diabru and Priyanta Jayawardena. The commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption thereby requested for the petitioner to withdraw the petition as measures would be taken to probe the complaint. However, the petitioner, attorney at law Nagananda Kotituaku, refused to do so and mentioned that the number of MPs who had engaged in this act had risen to 45. The attorney informed the Supreme Court that as per Article 3 of the Constitution of Sri Lanka, sovereignty is in the people and it is the duty and task of the Attorney General to represent the people and appear on behalf of the people. The petition will be taken up on the 9th of May. A duty-free vehicle permit has been given for all MPs and ministers. In the open market, a permit is sold for 25 million to 30 million rupees. 45 persons who obtain such permits have registered these vehicles under private institutions with the Department of Motor Traffic. 111 such vehicles are present in the country and a majority are Land Cruiser Prado SUVs. Prado Jeeps? Former DIG Anurad Senanayaka, who was arrested over the homicide of late rugby player Wasim Tajdeen, has been further remanded until the 30th of March. Upon permission granted by court, the suspect made a special statement today. Anurad Senanayaka notes that he is charged with concealing evidence of a homicide and that he can be granted bail by the magistrate's court. He adds that his fundamental rights have been violated as he was remanded for almost 10 months. Anurad Senanayaka claims that it is unjust for him to be placed in remand custody without apprehending the real culprit. Court ruled that this is a homicide and a report has been produced. Six months later, the CID is being told to apprehend the killers. What I feel is that the suspects were well aware since the beginning that this is not a death that resulted in a car crash. North Central Province High Court Judge Manjula Tiragratna ordered for former chairman of the Mihintale Pradesh Sabha Anil Pushpananda and another to be sentenced to 19 years and 6 months of rigorous imprisonment. The verdict was delivered as they were found guilty of setting fire to the residence and medical centre of former UNP Anuradhapura district manager Dr. Raja John Pulle. One of the suspects is already deceased and three other suspects were acquitted from the case and released. The residence and medical centre of Dr. Raja John Pule were set on fire during the run-up to the 2008 Provincial Council elections, causing 50 million rupees in damages. The five military personnel who were arrested over the abduction and assault of journalist Keith Noya were remanded until the 30th of this month. The suspects were to be subject to an identification parade for the second day today. However, it did not take place due to the absence of Keith Noya. Mohammed Niaz Naufer, alias Putta Naufer, who was convicted over the killing of former High Court Judge Sarat Abepitya, was admitted to the Kandy General Hospital today. A spokesperson for the hospital revealed that Naufer was admitted to carry out some tests related to kidney disease. He was later discharged from hospital. A hospital source said treatment will be based on the test results. The Department of Prison said that Mohammed Niaz Naufer, alias Porta Naufer, was escorted to the hospital under tight security provided by the prison officials and Sri Lanka police. Foreign Minister Mangala Samaravira says that the constitution would need to be amended to facilitate the arrival of foreign judges to Sri Lanka. Speaking to reporters at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mangala Samaravira said that the government secured a two-year extension on the 13th of March to implement the UNHRC resolution adopted on Sri Lanka in 2015. <laughs> With regards to this resolution, the international community has done away with the investigations that were undertaken before and has decided to stop the process carried out by us. We have requested for a two-year extension from the United Nations Human Rights Council and the international community in order for us to follow the roadmap. We have asked for two years. We believe that during the course of the two years, we will be able to complete the reconciliation process.
under the present constitution, there is no provision for foreign judges. If foreign judges are to enter, there has to be a constitutional amendment. The UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues says that Sri Lanka risks losing its momentum on the reconciliation process unless issues such as demilitarization and return of lands are immediately looked into. She expressed these views during the 34th regular session at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. The National Unity Government established in January 2015 has brought a great deal of hope to the country with an ambitious set of constitutional and governance reforms. Achieving peaceful coexistence after the long and devastating civil war requires a comprehensive, well-planned and well-coordinated truth, reconciliation, healing and accountability process. While such goals cannot be accomplished overnight, I acutely felt the mounting frustrations across the country about the pace of progress. Five months have passed since my visit when I urged the government to seize the momentum and put in place some immediate, important and concrete measures to clearly demonstrate its political will and commitment to better protect the country's minorities. Today I repeat this message. Unless those critical issues which are among the most pressing and emotive, especially for the Tamil and Muslim communities, such as those relating to demilitarization, disappeared persons, land return and security related detainees are immediately addressed, there is a real risk that this hard-earned momentum would be lost. The standing invitation extended by the government in December 2015 to the UN Special Procedures Mandate holders is a gesture of the constructive spirit in which the government seeks to work with all its partners, including civil society. We have had several productive interactive dialogues in the recent past, including with the SR on torture last week. Sri Lanka is pleased that the Special Rapporteur has acknowledged and commended the positive developments that have taken place and acknowledges the facilitation of all official meetings that she had requested for and the provision of unrestricted and unimpeded access for her and to her delegation to all the places that she wished to visit throughout the country during the visit. The government is mindful of the concerns regarding certain personal and customary laws having a discriminatory impact on women, in particularly the Candian law, the Tesavalame, the Muslim law, and these aspects are being addressed through policy interventions and legislative reforms. Meanwhile, issuing a media release, the U.S. State Department notes that the United States, together with several other nations, tabled a draft resolution on promoting reconciliation, accountability and human rights in Sri Lanka. The media release further notes that Sri Lanka has agreed to co-sponsor the resolution. The United States has also applauded the administration of President Maitripala Sirisena for its continuing efforts to promote reconciliation. Welcome back to the news. A ceremony to present land deeds and grant documents to 25,000 families in the Hambantara district was held under the auspices of President Maitripala Sirsena. Minister Mahinda Amaravira, Chief Minister of the Southern Province, Shan Vijayalal de Silva and other dignitaries attended the ceremony. <laughs> The government is planning to implement a system with a firm target which will be effective than the current system. You all know that we have named 2017 as the year to eradicate poverty. Mahinda Amaravira is the Minister of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources and also the General Secretary of the UPFA. So the problem is that this district has three ministerial positions, isn't it? Those three ministerial positions belong to the Tangol electorate. I think we should change that immediately. So I am planning to give my fullest support to Minister Mahinda Amaravira in implementing an effective development plan to the Hambantara district and in rendering his service to the country. Also, all the ministers and MPs must keep in mind that we all should work together as a government to develop this country. Meanwhile, President Maitri Pala Sirisena opened the newly built Nonagama Cultural Centre in Ambalam Thoda today. Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government Faiza Mustafa engaged in an inspection tour of Colombo this morning. 
The ministry inspected if there is proper disposal of garbage in areas including Armour Street, Maligawat and Tumulla, together with the officials of the ministry and the environmental police. The ministry instructed the environmental police to take strict legal actions against those who do not dispose garbage in a proper manner. <laughs> The minister also inspected the garbage disposal systems in hotels in the area. This has always been a problem. I am paying for the sins that were committed before. Since the media has been asking me constantly, we will do the needful to hold the elections as soon as possible. There is a problem when reaching into an agreement for four years. We need to look into the efficiency of those responsible. When an agreement is reached, it is renewed annually. I will responsibly state that there will be problems when an agreement is reached for four years. On to some business news tonight, Sri Lanka's economy grew by an estimated 4.4% in 2016, slowing down from 4.8% a year earlier owing to inclement weather throughout 2016. According to the Department of Census and Statistics, this was the weakest performance of the Sri Lankan economy since 2013. Sri Lanka's gross domestic product grew 5.3% in the fourth quarter of 2016, but annual growth slowed to 4.4% in 2016 compared to the previous year. Overall agriculture activities contracted 4.2% in 2016, owing to inclement weather throughout 2016. The Department of Census and Statistics said during 2016, the highest growth rate of 6.7% came from industrial activities. Services grew 4.2% compared to the previous year. Agriculture contributed 7.5% to GDP, industry 27.1%, services 57% and taxes less subsidies 8.4% in 2016. In news overseas, according to police sources, a letter exploded when it was opened at the offices of the International Monetary Fund in central Paris. One person sustained injuries. The IMF employee received hand and facial injuries and the staff were evacuated. IMF Director Christine Lagarde condemned the cowardly act of violence against IMF staff. She added in a statement that the IMF was working closely with the French authorities to investigate the letter bomb. And that wraps up Prime Time News. I'm Sonali Vanikabadige. And I'm Ramesh Rugal Bandara. Good night.